Happy Sabbath, PC Church and family. Um, I hope you guys are ready to worship with us. Our first song is going to be Friend of God. So please stand up and join us. Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me? Is it true that you are thinking of me? How you love me? It's amazing. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. I'm a friend. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Who am I that you are mindful of? You are thinking of me, how you love me. It's amazing. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. God Almighty, Lord of glory, you have called me friend. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. We are delighted that you are joining here us here for worship today. We've been having an amazing week here, and there's been some exciting things going on on our campus. We have our chaplain, Pastor Kent Rufo, with us. Pastor Rufo, tell us what's been happening on our campus this week. Thank you for having me. Uh, this week we've had Student Week of Prayer, and what's been so awesome about these speakers is they've all been speaking on unseen that's the theme for the week is called unseen and the idea is that there is hope in the unseen even amongst like amidst this time period with everything that's going on in the world they they're telling their personal stories of how they found hope in this 
Wow, that sounds really amazing. And I know, Pastor Dave, you're anxious as I'm anxious. We know it's a student week of prayer, but can you share with us about the different types of student leaders that have been sharing on our campus? So this is also what's awesome about this, is that it is not just what we typically pick as like the regular student leaders that are doing the same thing over and over and are involved in everything. We have one person from the basketball team. We have one that is my student chaplain. We have a couple that have been student missionaries before. Uh, but there's such a myriad of people that are doing the week of prayer this week. I think what's so awesome, what, what's most powerful about Student Week of Prayer is that this is students sharing their heart and their love for Jesus with each other. And I think that's what really comes through during a Student Week of Prayer like this. So today, we we're obviously watching this on our church feed today, but what if we wanted to go back during the week and, and look at the archives and, and see the past presentations? How do we do that? You can't. Sorry. Yeah. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm joking. So you can. Um, I don't know if you know this, but PUC has its own YouTube channel. So you have to go to PUC, PUC.edu slash YouTube. And that's PUC.edu slash YouTube. And you can go back and you can go back and watch other Vespers and everything. But for the week of prayer, that's included in there. That's amazing. Uh, you know, I am just so excited about the program that is about to unfold. We know that God has an amazing blessing in store for us. We have a special children's feature that will be coming up in just a moment. But Pastor Dave, why don't you open us up in a word of prayer today? I would love to. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, thank you again for the way your spirit moves through the week and uh, fills our heart gives us light, gives us hope, strengthens our faith, encourages us in our walk with Jesus. And today, Father, as we come to the, the, the culminating Sabbath of our student week of prayer, I thank you for the way that these students have been sharing their heart and sharing their faith with each other and with us. And I pray, Father, especially today, as we as a church celebrate this student week of prayer, that our hearts will find your spirit again drawing us closer and closer and closer to you. We know, Jesus, that you're coming soon. And as these students, as a, an army of youth, lead us to your throne of grace, we lift them up, we pray for them, and we are thankful for the way that they speak to us as well. Bless this service today. Bless this campus, this community, and this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do we even know what it means to hope? Hey guys, it's me again, Douglas, and today I want to talk to you guys about hope. Yeah, because I, I feel like it's a really important topic in scripture, but it's also something that I think I think we really kind of misunderstand, because I feel like we don't even know what the word hope means anymore. You know, sometimes sometimes words like change their meaning. That's just something that happens with, with language. It just sort of changes over time. Like, did you know that the word nice originally meant not so smart? Yeah, or awful used to mean amazing yet yeah, or terrific meant super scary now those words kind of almost mean the opposite and i feel like the word hope is doing the same thing because the word hope means to expect something that you want to happen will happen and i feel like it's almost backwards now like for me if i make plans to go outside and play with my friends but i see that there are storm clouds up ahead i might say oh man i really hope it doesn't rain or i might say oh man i really hope we don't have a whole lot of homework this school year when I say those things, really what I'm saying is, I don't want it to rain, but it probably will. Or I don't want a whole lot of homework, but we'll probably get a whole lot of homework. And that understanding of the word hope is like backwards of what hope is supposed to be. Hope is trust. If you hope that something will happen, it's supposed to mean that you want it to happen and you believe that it will happen. And so it's almost like we think that hope means you want something good to happen, but you expect something bad, which can be very confusing when the Bible says that we should put our hope in the Lord, or that our God is the God of hope. Well, let me tell you something. God is not the God of wishful thinking. Our God, the one true God, is the God of fulfilled promises. That means when you put your hope in the Lord, you are believing that what he says is true. You're believing that he can do what he says he will do. 
You know, when someone makes you a promise, you, you have two choices. Either you can believe that they're going to keep their promise, or you can believe that they're not going to keep their promise. And if you believe that they're going to keep their promise, what you are doing is hoping. Now, it would be weird because if, if someone says, oh, I promise I'll do this thing for you, and you say, yeah, I hope you do, that almost sounds like you're saying, yeah, I don't think you will, but you better. But no, really, truly, the real kind of hope is an expectation for good. So putting your hope in Jesus Christ means that you believe that what he says is true, that he can do what he's promised. So when I say my hope is in the Lord, that's like skydiving kind of hope. You know, when somebody jumps out of a plane to go skydiving, I'm sure, I'm positive. I've never gone skydiving myself, but I'm positive that they check those parachutes at least twice, probably like four times to make sure that they will work when you jump out of that airplane. But when it comes right down to it, you don't know that it's going to work. You can't prove that it's going to work until you jump out of an airplane and pull pull the chute. And you know, the truth is that hope and trust can be really hard for us because there is nothing on earth that you can fully trust other than Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying that to say that we should never hope in anything. We should never trust anything. Because the fact is we hope in a lot of things. We put our trust in a whole lot of stuff, even if you don't realize it. But I am saying that Jesus Christ is the only one ever, the only thing, the only person who will always, always keep his promises. Stuff lets us down. There are times where parachutes break. But our God is the God of fulfilled promises. We can trust in the Lord. We can put our hope in Jesus Christ. There is hope in the Lord. And when it comes right down to it, Jesus Christ is our only hope. So my challenge to you guys today is that you would trust in the Lord that you would lean on him, that you would expect him to keep his word, because he will. Jesus said that if you believe in him, if you trust in him, then you will have eternal life. I have hope in Jesus Christ. And I have hope that I've been forgiven for my sins. And I have hope that one day he will come back and will make all things new, make everything right. And when I say I have hope, I'm not saying I really wish this would happen. I'm saying I believe it. I expect it. I trust it will happen. I have hope in the Lord. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Thank you so much for having us to worship you for PUC, joining us for church. Um, we're going to sing one more song for you guys, and we invite you guys to stand up at home and sing with us. It's called Happy. You make me happy. You make me whole. You take the pain away. I'm so in love with you. You make me happy. Everything 
morning and happy Sabbath. I am honored to speak for you guys today. Let's start with a quick word of prayer before I begin. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to gather here today. And I ask that you may please be with each and every person here that is listening and help me to speak your word clearly. Amen. So everyone who knows me knows that I love to spend time outdoors and especially go rock climbing. I'm not a particularly good rock climber, but I know the basics and I like to go out and do it for fun. I really started getting into climbing when I came to college and met a lot more fellow rock climbers. During the weekends, we like to go climbing on Mount St. Helena or any other place with good routes. But we also like to go climbing in the gym on the evenings to get more practice. And in the gym, there is this one particular 5.11 route that is very challenging for me to complete. So night after night, I kept trying to climb the same route, but every time I missed the same hold near the top of the route. One night, I go to the gym and I'm telling myself that this is the night I'm going to conquer this route. I clip into the auto belay and I start climbing. And as soon as I get to the new spot, I try the same maneuver over and over, but I continue to miss it. Each time the auto belay slowly lowers me back down to the floor and I start climbing again. This keeps going on and on and I'm not making any new progress. Finally, I decide to take a moment and step back away from the wall to figure out how else I can approach this. And once I kind of have a strategy in mind, I begin climbing again. I get back up to the very hold that is giving me all my trouble and I shift my weight to the tips of my toes so that I can get the height and leverage I need to grab a hold of it. And in that moment, I suddenly have two fingers on the hold and that's all that's keeping me on the wall. But of course, my fingers start cramping and I begin to slip. Suddenly, I realize I'm falling off the wall at a miraculous speed. Nothing is catching me or slowing me down this time. And in my mind, I'm saying, oh dear, this is not good. But before I could even finish the thought, I hit the ground like a sack of potatoes. There was nothing graceful about how I landed because it happened instantly. All I can remember is my head bouncing off of the hardwood floor because I had somehow managed to miss landing on the mat entirely. And my body kind of just twisted in all kinds of different directions. And while I'm laying there on the gym floor, I suddenly realized the critical mistake that no rock climber should ever make. I was not clipped in to the auto belay. At some point in between climbing this route many times, I had unclipped from the auto belay without realizing it and started climbing without any protection. And I felt so stupid in that moment. I couldn't believe that I had just made a mistake that I didn't think I was possible of making. And I was so embarrassed, I didn't even want my friends to call an ambulance because I didn't want to attract more attention or tell anyone else what just happened. In a sense, I had lost my connection to the one thing that was keeping me safe. By this point, you're probably wondering why am I sharing this embarrassing story with you now? You may be personally thinking that I'm not crazy enough to go rock climbing or pull an Alex Honnold, or I'm not stupid enough to forget to attach a rope to my climbing harness when I do. The obvious point of the story is to remind you to always double check that you are tied into the rope if you're rock climbing. But the more important point of the story is to ask you whether you are making a similar mistake as me in my climbing career as you are making in your spiritual life. Are you truly checking that you are connected to God? Let me share a similar story with you in the Bible that I imagine you're all familiar with. It appears in Matthew 14. At this point in the Bible, Jesus is performing many miracles in front of the disciples. 
He's just fed the 5,000 with five loaves of bread and two fish. And as soon as the meal was finished, he tells the disciples to go in their boat while he dismisses the people. Starting in verse 23, it reads, With the crowd dispersed, Jesus climbed the mountain so he could be by himself and pray. He stayed there alone late into the night. Meanwhile, the boat was far out to sea when the wind came up against them, and they were battered against the waves. At about four o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. They were scared out of their wits. A ghost, they said, crying out in terror. But Jesus was quick to comfort them. Courage, it's me. Don't be afraid. Peter, suddenly bold, said, Master, if it's really you, call me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, Come ahead. Jumping out of the boat, Peter walked on the water to Jesus. But when he looked down at the waves, churning beneath his feet, he lost his nerve and started to sink. Reading this passage, I'm starting to see some similarities between Peter and I, metaphorically speaking. First of all, Peter and I both took our eyes off of our lifeline. I failed to look at the auto belay, and Peter took his eyes off of Jesus. Second of all, when we both realized things were out of our control and we were not in a safe position, we started to fall. Granted, Peter realized the danger he was in long before me. In a sense, we both lost our connection to our Savior. I was so focused on reaching the top of the route by my own strength and will that I lost sight of the other important things around me. And Peter became so scared in his situation when he saw the waves crashing around him that he forgot that Jesus was the one truly in control. Luckily, Peter cried out, Master, save me. And Jesus didn't hesitate. In verse 31, it says, Jesus reached down and grabbed his hand. Then he said, Faint hearted, what got into you? The two of them climbed into the boat, and the wind died down. The disciples in the boat, having watched the whole thing, worshiped Jesus, saying, This is it. You are God's son, for sure. I wish that when I was climbing that route, that Jesus was able to catch me as soon as I started to fall. However, he still did save me. Looking back, I realized that I could have been paralyzed for making such a critical mistake. Luckily for me, I only cracked four vertebrae, and I was able to make a full recovery after many months. God had protected me, but he had also forced me to slow my life way down while I was in a back brace. I couldn't do any of the outdoor activities that I loved. However, I was given the opportunity to reconnect with God. I realized during that time that I was attributing most of my success in school to myself, and I wasn't spending enough personal time with God. Somewhere I had caught and disconnected and it took falling off of a 25-foot wall for me to realize how truly disconnected I was. Unlike Peter, we aren't able to just look up and see Jesus standing in front of us to find our connection again. But we can find comfort in knowing that Jesus is right beside us, even though we cannot see him physically. And we can also find peace knowing that we have many ways to connect with him. One of those ways is to read your Bible, as you've been taught since you were a little child. Reading the Bible lets us understand our Savior and how we can best serve Him. In order to have a relationship with anybody, it's important to get to know the person first. And the Bible is the only way that we can get to know God. Another way to reconnect with God is to pray daily, and not just when we are in need of rescuing. Communication is the only way to establish a strong and trustful relationship. And praying allows us to have a personal conversation with God whenever we need to. 
These two things are building blocks for establishing a connection to God. But there are also many other ways to get closer to Him. Personally, I love to take hikes in the back 40 on Sabbath mornings. And when I arrive in the forest, I love to just sit there silently for a few moments and take in all the beauty around me. When I remove all other worldly distractions, I find myself more at peace knowing that I'm in God's presence and immersed in His creation. Perhaps singing, playing music, or worshiping with others allows you to feel closer to God. It's important for you to find out how you can best feel close to God. These things seem simple in theory, but may be a lot harder to implement in real life, especially while going to college. It takes time to build a relationship with God. However, I encourage you to dedicate as much time as you can to God, because He can give you the strength and security you need in life once you know and have a relationship with Him established. It goes without saying that 2020 presented a mountain of challenges, and I imagine that this new year will present many of its own trials. However, I want to remind you that when you are climbing the mountain of challenges that are continually placed in front of you, you want to make sure that you are not relying on your soul ability and strength to make it to the end. You want to make sure that safety measures are in place and that you're protected at all times. And the only way that can happen is if we are connected to God. If we know without a doubt that He will protect us when we begin to fall, then it makes the climb a lot easier. Let's bow our head for a final word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for always being there with us and thank you for always reaching out to establish a connection with us. Help us to make sure that we are connected to you and that we can trust you with all of our strength to guide us through all the difficult things we may face. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Come on, sing it if you know it. Water you turn. Water you turn into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the as we rise, there's no one like you, none like you. Come on, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Come on, sing into the darkness, into the darkness you shine, out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you. Sing it out, say our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, hey, our God. Come on, say it, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher. Than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Come on.
Come on, say, and if our God, and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Come on, if you believe that, say, then what could stand? What could stand? is here, awesome in power, our God, our God. 